That is going to be hard to follow. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to start off uh, this morning uh, with just giving everyone an update on how all the youth activities are going and, and what's been going on. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, stuff on Wednesdays. Uh, this past Wednesday, we had a uh, volleyball and a chili dog night. Uh, we had a pretty good turnout for that. We had uh, 25 people come, and um, a lot of them had never even been to a church before, so that was really awesome. Um, lately, we've been having uh, some kids uh, from across the street come um, to Wednesday night, and they didn't even know what the Bible was when they started. So seeing them, you know, grow up and start to ask a lot more questions and, and seeing, you know, them learn how the world was created, how it was created by God and seeing like, you know, their eyes open and just, just, it's been amazing, you know, it's, it's really been amazing seeing people impacted and people inspired and kids, you know, learning about God. So, you know, God's doing a lot of, of great work through that. Um, upcoming this uh, next month, I just want to let you guys know what we'll be doing. Uh, we have three different events. Um, and they're loading. Okay, so uh, on Wednesday, uh, May 16th, uh, we're going to have an ice cream and board game night. Uh, so if you know any teenagers, any youth who want to come, you know, We'd be glad to have them. Uh, they can bring any board games, favorite ice cream, whatever. You know, we'll have stuff there. Uh, if they don't want to bring anything, that's fine. Just, uh, yeah, let them know. We'd love to have them. Uh, then on May 25th, uh, we'll be having a movie night. We'll be showing Case for Christ. Uh, if any of you haven't seen that, it's a really good movie. Um, really, it really, you know, impacted me and, and you know, the fight against uh, atheism and, and w how we can share our faith. So it's, you know, it, it's a really good uh, resource. Um, and then on May 9th, we'll also be doing a volleyball thing. We'll be having pizza this time. Um, there were some, a lot of people there who were interested in um, coming back to that. So, so we're gonna keep that going and see if we can get a, a bigger crowd this time. So yeah, that's what we'll be doing in our youth group. Um, so yeah. Just, just so you guys know what's going on. Also, yeah, we had, um, in the last two weeks, we had four baptisms uh, through the youth group uh, that meets on Thursday nights. Uh, sometimes we meet at the Air's house, sometimes here. Definitely had to meet here for the baptisms. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really been uh, good. God's been working a lot through, through everything that's been going on through the church and, and through the youth group. So, yeah. Anyway, so we're talking about chains this morning. And... What are chains? Chains physically are chains, you know? What do you do with chains? You bind things. People are held captive by chains, you know? Chains, you know, are not really a symbol of, of good things, you know? It's keep out, keep away, lock you up, you know? Um, Peter and Paul uh, were in chains and can only be set free from God. Those were physical chains, physical chains that could only be broken by God. But today we're going to talk about spiritual chains. What is chaining us? What chains do we have in our lives? You know, today we live in America. This is the freest country in the world. So we're thinking chains, you know, <laughs> I don't have chains, but we all have chains. We have spiritual chains, chains that you can't see, chains that hold us back. So we're going to talk about what those chains are. Um, we all have different sins and temptations that chain us down. That's what ch chains we have, the chains of sin. We've all been chained by sin. So we're going to take a look at Galatians 5, uh, 16 through 21 to kind of find out what some of those uh, chains are. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and read this. <clears throat> so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, 
you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the spiritual chains that face everyone today are, as it said there in the first part of that, the desires of the flesh. So we're going to take a look at these, you know, and, and go through them. What are the desires of the flesh? What are the things that chain us down? So in that first one, sexual immorality, it's, it's so prevalent in today, you know? No matter where you go, you see evidence that we as society, everyone is chained by sexual immorality. There's lust, adultery, pornography. You know, you can't even walk through the mall without seeing evidence of the sexual immorality going on today. It's, it's horrible. It's something that has so changed society. This is something that, that Satan has pushed into the face of everyone and made a huge temptation. It's one of the biggest chains that we face. Um, the next one, um, impurity. You know, when we look at impurity, that's, that's performing immoral acts. You know, that's, that's it's basically <laughs> performing anything mentioned in here, you know? Impurity, uncleansliness. Uh, the next one, uh, debauchery. Um, also, like idolatry. Uh, putting something else before God. Now this one, you know, you, it's also kind of hard to see sometimes where anything in our lives that is bigger than God can be a source of idolatry. It could be friends, it could be food, it could be drink, it could be anything. Anything that we put in our lives higher than God is idolatry. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that we're fashioning an idol for ourselves out of wood or stone or anything. It's idolatry. What is most important to you? That's how you find out where your faith is. It's how you find out where your trust is. Is your trust in God or is your trust in things? <clears throat> so looking at uh, the next ones, whoops, wrong way. Um, witchcraft. Now that one also <laughs> doesn't really affect a lot of us, but I have seen in, in churches where it has. Uh, there was one lady that I know who she had been part of Wicca, um, and her job was to go into churches and cause dissension, to cause division, to cause hatred between people. That was her specific mission given to her by her witchcraft group. And, you know, through Christ, she overcame that, and she actually got saved. But, you know, we may think, oh, witchcraft, you know, that's, that's not something. But it is something that can find its way into churches. It can find its way into life. You know, it's still going on. Uh, going to hatred. Hatred. Everyone knows what hatred is. And, you know, even Jesus said, hating your brother is akin to murder. You know, we don't want to hate. Jesus never gave us a spirit of hate. He gave us a spirit of love. Um, <clears throat> discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, all these things that are chains that are holding us back. Envy, drunkenness. I know in a lot of people, alcohol. And addiction can be a huge chain, something that can keep them from the relationship with God and keep them from the relationship with their family, with their friends, you know? I've seen that. I've seen that a lot. You know, it's, you walk downtown Exeter, there's, there's three bars right across the street from each other, you know? It's, it's, it's very prevalent. So with all these different chains, these different sizes, different shapes, um, different colors, different, you know, lengths. All these chains bind people. They bind us. 
They weigh us down. And we may think, oh, well, that person has more chains than I do. That person struggles with more things than I do. Just because somebody has 100 chains and you have one, you're both equally stuck. It only takes one chain. It only takes one sin to separate us from God. And so we're going to get to <clears throat> our second point. What do our chains do? What do our chains do to us? We know what our chains are. We know what the chains are. But what do they do? What effect do they have on our lives? And number one is they separate us from God. Isaiah 59.2. Uh, let me pull that up. Isaiah 59.2. Let me get it. <clears throat> Yeah, it separates us from God. Our chains separate us from God because God is perfect and holy and cannot tolerate sin. So our sin, our chains, separate us from having a relationship with a perfect and holy God. And let me just pull up this verse, Isaiah 59, if you want to pull it up with me. Uh, verse 2, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Our sins have separated us from God. God can't even look at us. They've hidden his face from us. How sad does that sound? That our sins have so separated us that God can't even look at us. When Jesus was on the cross, when he took the sins of the world, God had to turn his face. We don't want God's face turned away from us. We want to be in God's presence. We want to have a relationship with God. We don't want to be turned away from. We don't want to have that separation. In the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, there was that perfect communion. God walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden. Just think how amazing that is, that you could walk with God, that you could talk with God physically in the garden. How amazing that is, because there's no sin. There's no sin. Think about that. No temptation. No, well, there was temptation, but in heaven there will be no temptation, no desire, no desire to sin. You know, a lot of times we're like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. We end up doing it. You know, sin is all around us and we can't not sin and it separates us from God. Now, when a person's chained, when a person's chained, they can't move. God's there. We're chained by our sin. We can't get to God because we are chained. The chains stop us. You, we can't break these. Have you ever seen, like, like, you know, I could pull on this all day. I couldn't break it. It's a chain. So that's the number one thing that chains do. They separate us from God. Now, let's take a look at what else chains do. They drag us down. Now, in taking a look at Isaiah 1, verse 4, Woe to a sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. That guilt is great. That, that sentence there, guilt is great. It also can say loaded down with guilt, weighed down with guilt, weighed down with sin. We're weighed down. Our sin is so great that it weighs us down. I don't know if any of you have ever read Pilgrim's Progress, but in that book, Christian has a weight on his back. It's the weight of his sin. It's a physical pack that he carries with him everywhere. And every day, it takes him lower and lower and lower with everything that is chained to his back. It's chained there. Our sins, even though you can't see them physically on our backs, 
They're chained to our backs. They weigh us down. They weigh us down. The last thing that chains do is they hold us captive. And looking at Acts 8, uh, verse 23. There we go, or not. <clears throat> For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. This is when he's talking to Simon the sorcerer. And Simon comes up to him and says, you know, I want the same power that you guys have. Give it to me. How much can I buy it for? And Peter's like, no, no, you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. We're captive to our sin. We're held captive. Just like chains, we're held captive to our sin. It's strapped to us. We're strapped to it. We can't move ourselves from it. We're taken captive by the things that we do, by the sins that we commit, by the temptations that we give into. We're held captive by them. We're also going to look at John um, 8, verse 34. Jesus replied, Verily, true, Very truly, I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave to sin. A slave is someone who does not have their freedom. We're sins, slaves to sin. We don't have that freedom apart from Christ. We're chained. Slaves are chained. And without Christ, we have no hope. We can't break the chains ourselves. Our chains are so strong, so big that even when we don't want to do the things, we still end up chaining ourselves through our sin. We chain ourselves. Jesus said, this is Jesus. I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And who sins? Everyone. So we're all slaves to sin. We're all chained to sin. Sin has chained us and kept us away from God. And the chains just keep on growing and growing and adding and weighing us down until they're just so heavy and so big and we're weighed down by so many that what hope do we have? What hope do we have? So that's the big question is, what hope do we have? How do we get rid of our chains? We can't. We can't get rid of our chains. Not on our own. To get rid of our chains, we need the key. To unlock chains, you know, secured with a padlock, you need a key to open up the chains. You need a key to be free. So what is the key? What is that key? What is the key that God has given us, that God sent down? John 14, 6, and this is Jesus talking. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right there, that's the key. Jesus is the key. Jesus is the only key. He says right there, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's the one way. We have hope. We have hope of getting rid of the chains because Jesus has given us that hope. Jesus came down. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. He took our sins. He took our chains. He was died on the cross and took our chains with him so that we didn't have to go to hell. We didn't have to be dragged down by our chains. We didn't have to have that separation. We don't have to be weighed down because of what Jesus did. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Jesus took our chains. We didn't have to pay Jesus to take our chains. 
We didn't have to be good for Jesus to take our chains. Jesus took them. It was a free gift. We couldn't earn it. We don't deserve it. But Jesus took it. Why? Why would Jesus do that? Why would anyone do that? It was an agonizing death. It was death on the cross, crucifixion, excruciating death. But Jesus went and he did it willingly, willingly for us. He died willingly for us because he loved us. He loved us. Just think, what kind of love is that to die for somebody who doesn't even love you back? To offer that for someone who spurned you time and time again, who adds to the chains that you're taking away instead of, of anything else. We add to it. What, what, why? Why? Because of love. Because God loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved us. And through Christ, we are now set free. We're going to take a look at um, Romans 1 uh, through 6. <clears throat> Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Set you free. It's a whole theme through the Bible. We're chained down. We have chains. But Jesus has set us free. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. All those chains the chains that bind us to sin, the chains that bind us to death, have been set free. We've been set free. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. The law couldn't save us. The law couldn't save us. The only thing the law did was condemn us. That's all the law did. The law set what the standard was, and we couldn't keep it. We couldn't keep it. Even the, the rich young ruler who, who came to Jesus and said, all these things I've kept since my youth. Jesus said, sell your possessions, give them to the poor, and follow me couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. We can't follow the law. We can't follow the law to the letter. We can't do it. I probably went 56 in a 55 mile per hour zone today. We can't keep the law to the letter. We can't do it. You know, the law is there and the law condemns us. The law was powerless to do, to save us, because it was weakened by the flesh. It was weakened by us. The law is great, but we can't keep it. So God sent his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He sent him down in a man, as a man, with all the same temptations as we have. He had all the same fleshly desires, but he didn't give in to them. He didn't give in to them. He came, he lived a perfect life, the only person in all of eternity to do so. The only one who could do it. I can't do it. I mess up every day. I'm not good. Only Jesus could do it. He sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, an offering. Back in the Old Testament, Something had to die for every sin. That something was supposed to be us. But God made a way where a lamb could be sacrificed. Something had to die for our sin. Can you imagine that? If we had to kill something every time that we sinned, how much would you want to sin? 
if you had to kill a pet every time that you sinned, that would really take it into like, whoa, yeah, I do not want to sin. Every time we sin, we put Jesus on the cross. We put Jesus up there with our sin. Jesus was the perfect lamb who died. He, he came, he lived a perfect life so that we could be free from the law. We could be free from sin. We put him up there. We sinned. We fell short of the glory of God. Jesus stepped across. He came down. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, to die. He came to die. He came to live. He came to die. He came to save us. To save us. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. <clears throat> in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What's the righteous requirement of the law? The righteous requirement of the law is justice. What we deserve, justice. If someone goes and they commit a robbery and they murder a security guard and they come back and they're talking to the judge, they're like, you know, judge, I did those things. You know, I, I murdered that person, I robbed, I stole, you know, but I also do a lot of good things. I do a lot of great things. You know, I help out at different charity events. You know, I give my time. I, I, I give time to the poor. I go to church. You know, I do all these good things. So if the judge looks at him and says, you know what? I think that what good you've done has outweighed this, this crime you've committed. You can go free. Would that judge be a righteous judge? No. No. I've been an evil, corrupted judge. The righteous requirement of the law is justice. That we have to pay for our sins. The sins that were committed have to be paid for. And in that same way, in that same legal aspect, Jesus came in, he paid our fine. The crime was committed, but the debt was paid. The debt was paid by Jesus, so we didn't have to pay it, because we couldn't pay it. We couldn't pay it. The penalty was death. That's what we deserved, death and hell. We couldn't pay it, except with our own lives. And even that doesn't pay it. Jesus was the only one that paid it. The requirement of the law, the righteous requirement of the law, justice, might be fully met in us, because Jesus stepped in. Who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We're not chained to the flesh anymore. We're chained to God. We're with God. We're on God's side now. Isn't that amazing? We're on God's team. We don't have to be chained to the desires of the flesh anymore, because we're on God's side. <clears throat> those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Our mindset changes. Instead of desiring the fleshly desires anymore, our minds change. God renews our heart to focus on what God wants, our mindset on what the Spirit desires. No longer are we chained. We're not chained to the flesh of desire. We don't have to. But our mind is set on what God wants. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. That's the biggest point there, is that when we're chained to the flesh, the end result, no matter what you do, no matter how good you are, no matter how many people you help, no matter how many times you go to church, the end result is death. 
But the mind governed by the Spirit, by God, is life and peace. We have that life in Jesus Christ. And that's something really good, you know? That's amazing because we can't make it on our own. Mind governed by flesh is death. No matter how we go about it, we're still going to end up dead in our sins, in hell, on our own, without Jesus. That's why he came. That's why he loved us. That's why he stepped in, took our place. So, in conclusion, does that mean that we don't sin anymore? No. Even though the chains are broken, we're human and we still have the scars from the chains. But God has taken that. God has taken the chains. God has taken the chains before. They're put on us. God took those chains. He died for the sins that we've committed and the sins that we will commit. Jesus died for us. And now we need to not continue living like we are chained when we've been set free. Don't live like you're chained. Don't continue living in your chained lifestyle. Like the verse said, the mind governed by flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. So live like your mind is governed by the spirit which is life and peace. Don't live in the flesh anymore. Don't do it. You know, that's one of Satan's biggest lies, is that God cannot love us enough to free us from everything. And so even though God has freed us, we live like we're chained. And that holds us back. That holds us back from God's blessings, and it holds us back from blessing others. It holds us back. Because we live like we're still chained. We're dragged down by chains that aren't there. We have to accept that God took those chains. God took them. Jesus died for those chains. So don't keep carrying them. Don't pick them up again. You're not chained to the wall anymore, so don't drag that junk around with you. Yeah, come on. Don't drag it. Don't, don't do it. So we're going to look at one final verse here for a closing song. Galatians 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Christ has set us free. All these chains, all these chains that bound us, Jesus has taken them and he's thrown them down. They're gone. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't put it back on. Jesus took it off. Don't put it back on. You're free. You don't have to live that life. You don't have to be a slave anymore. Jesus took off the yoke of slavery and freed us. So are you going to accept it? Are you going to live like you are free, like your chains are gone? Or are you going to continue living in a lifestyle of desires of the flesh? Jesus has freed us. Now we've got to make the choice.